Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Today, our guest is Professor Salim Tamari. A sociologist at Buzet University has served as director of the Institute of Palestine Studies and is currently the editor of the Jerusalem Quarterly. His list of publication is nearly endless, but I want to mention just two of them as we will talk about throughout the interview. The translation of the diary and memoir of Wasif Chouaria, a musician, a Jerusalemite, and the Year of the Locust, the translation of the diary of Isan Turjman, another Jerusalemite who died during the First World War. Salim, welcome. The first question I want to ask is, what is Jerusalem for you? In other words, what is your connection to the city? Well, I'll start by COVID, since it's the living in the era of COVID. Um, well, I grew up in uh, the Jerusalem area, in the town of Ramallah. I went to primary and secondary school in Ramallah. And Jerusalem was our big city. So on weekends, we would go, uh, you know, to uh, visit friends, have coffee, have a meal, go to the cinema. Uh, all our, uh, in my childhood, all the major hospitals and major schools were in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was 20 minutes away by car, two hours walking, uh, and it was the big city in the neighborhood. Ramallah was a tiny little town of uh, 15,000 people, and uh, the most Pressing thing I have from my childhood memory of Jerusalem is the airport. Uh, Kalandia Airport was actually closer to Ramallah than to Jerusalem, but it was called Jerusalem Airport. And in the 60s, when I became an adult, um, we used to, it was our window to the world. We would fly to Beirut, uh, Cairo. Damascus, Baghdad, from Jerusalem. It was the main airport for Jordan, which controlled the West Bank of Jordan after the War of 48. My earliest memory of the airport was an avenue for freedom to get out and see the world. Uh, I remember flying to Beirut in uh, 60, 61, and then to Cairo again, and then when I left the country uh, to study in the U.S. in 1964, I flew from Jerusalem to Beirut, from Beirut to Paris, from Paris to New York. Uh, I want to tell you something about this early memory of the airport, if you would allow me, uh, because it was such an exciting presence. Uh, the airport was located in an area called Kalandia, which is the site of one of the major uh, refugee camps in the West Bank. And the road to Jerusalem crossed with the runway of the airport, exactly at a crossing. And there was a, what do you call it? This um, uh, barrier, which allows only traffic in either for the airplanes or for the cars. So every day, two or three car, two or three planes landed and left from Kalandia Airport. So when the uh, planes land, the barrier would be closed and all the cars from both sides would stop. And I remember being very excited driving with my father in my father's car 
to be stopped to see the planes coming down. And when that happens, uh, there'll be uh, local salespeople selling soft drinks, tea, coffee, and uh, light refreshment. So people would stand by the barrier of the planes coming down and up. And that's one of the most exciting memories of my childhood. When uh, the Israelis um, conquered the West Bank and took over Jerusalem, the airport became part of the Israeli system. And we were, of course, locked out. We were uh, separated from the Arab world, so we could no longer fly from Jerusalem airport, but that airport became part of the Israeli internal network and uh, it uh, became the landing site for Arkea Airlines, which is the Israeli internal uh, flying system. Flight would go to Haifa and Elat, and the UN used it for flight to Lebanon and to Cyprus, I believe. But we were not allowed to use these planes. So the airport became a forbidden zone for us. We could only use the Israeli airports uh, at the beginning. So we could, we could only go to Jordan to fly. And so the loss of Jerusalem airport as an avenue to the world was a big uh, traumatic experience for us. It sounds like uh, the airport was uh, uh, this place uh, of attractions. And uh, I too remember as a child uh, being taken to see planes uh, uh, in a small airport uh, not far away where I grew up to see planes, uh, you know, taking off and, and landing. And it was quite a spectacle. I guess nowadays kids don't even pay attention to you know, the, the majestic uh, image of a plane uh, taking off, landing, and of course also thinking about uh, uh, the imagination, places to go, places to visit. Uh, uh, you know, nowadays they, they can reach every place in minutes or through, you know, watching uh, media uh, images. Uh, so I guess it, it was really, really different. N now, I, I really wanted to go and ask something about uh, the Jerusalem you've been working on for the past few decades, but I, I've been fascinated about this image of the Jerusalem of the 1960s and 70s, uh, which I must say not much has been written about. So I was wondering, Salim Tamari as a teenager and as a young adult uh, going around the city, what are your memories? What, what is that you you cherish the most, but also, uh, you know, you found that it was hard to deal with when wondering about the city of Jerusalem. Well, the Jerusalem I remember from that period was a Jerusalem that was divided by barbed wire and by a blockade which separated the eastern part from the western part. Uh, the no man's land, no man's land um, existed along the walls of the old town of the city and crisscrossed with the uh, Mandel Gate in the Musrara area, it was moved north to Sheikh Jarrah so that the Arab part of the town, which was on the Jordanian side, was the area bounded by Musrara, Sheikh Jarrah and the walls of the city. And I remember clearly that we used to go the other side from the uh, top floor of the prayer school, which was located near the new gate. And I have vivid memoirs of uh, looking from the walls and we could see the Jordanian soldiers on this side and the Israeli soldiers on the other side. And it was a very eerie um, site because the no man's land was completely deserted, full of destruction. And of course, you may remember that the heavy bombardment of Fort Eight, I don't mean you remember from memory, but from historical knowledge, left 
a lot of the buildings on that seam line completely destroyed, uh, including the uh, Baramki house, which was known as the Turjman post. But the main building which blocked the east from the west was the Notre Dame building that was laying totally deserted and uh, full of holes. Uh, my cousin, my aunt and my cousins lived in the Musrara area. So we would, they, their houses were just on no man's land. So from the windows, we could see the other side. And it was a very uh, tragic sight because we knew that this was the city which my family grew up. I, I, I come from a Jaffa family, but part of my uh, father's family also came from Jerusalem, and most of them had relocated from the western side of the city to the eastern side. And they remained on the seam lines, but the property was on the other side. Uh, so that was the vision of a divided city uh, full of barbed wire that came to sudden end in the June uh, 67 war. You asked me what uh, Jerusalem meant to me at that time. Well, it was a place where we would go to the cinema. We would go, we would have dates with uh, uh, girlfriends because we were not free to um, appear in public in a small town, conservative town like Ramallah. So we would go and seek these rendezvous in Jerusalem. Most of the places we would go were located uh, on Salah Din Street and inside the old city. So the old city was the, the city for me uh, as I grew up. One of the most striking features of Jerusalem that comes to life through your work, it's cosmopolitanism, a process uh, and uh, a condition we may say, that the Ottomans developed, fostered, and that certainly existed through the Ottoman time, but also through the British Mandate period. What does remain of that cosmopolitanism? Is Jerusalem, uh, you know, post-1948 uh, still a cosmopolitan city in some way? Well, I would not call it uh, cosmopolitan. I mean, it may have had cosmopolitan features in the late Ottoman period and during the mandate, but the war actually separated Jerusalem uh, from its uh, hinterland to the west and certainly from access to the sea and the coastal area. So the, the port city of Jerusalem was, of course, Jaffa, and that was separated from it in the war. Uh, Jerusalem remained a major administrative center. It became the capital of the West Bank and Amman was the capital of the, of the East Bank. The uh, conditions for the merger between the West Bank and the East Bank in 1951 stipulated that the federal capital alternate between Amman and Jerusalem, but that never happened. Amman remained the capital. All the press that used to thrive in Jerusalem had relocated to Amman. Very few publications uh, remained on the on the on the Jerusalem side. I remember a, a cultural monthly called Al Jadid, which was still being published in Jerusalem, uh, and later on Al Fajr. Uh, appeared as a daily newspaper, and Nahar, which was a pro-Jordanian um, uh, daily. Um, I myself remember I was editor of the, uh, the Birzeit University uh, uh, magazine called Al-Ghadir. I was editor of Al-Ghadir between 62 and 64. And I used to the, go to the commercial press in Jerusalem. That was the name of the press. And I would sit with the printer and he would hand uh, set the tabloid on a frame. 
and then which I would dictate to him from the uh, from the proofs I had, and then he would do a blueprint, and then I would correct it by hand. It was actually a blueprint, as the name signifies, and then Al Ghadir would come out in four pages once a month, and this was one of the most exciting. Uh, uh, periods in my youth producing this newspaper on a monthly basis it was a student paper. Um, it was heavily censored at the time, so we could not address political issues. And we did a, a, another um, supplement called Palestine, which uh, was printed on a, a mimeographed machine at the college. That wasn't uh, illegal, uh, but it was a supplement to Al Ghadir, the new school newspaper. So it was an official version and an unofficial version called Philistine. That was also in Jerusalem because the printing presses were all in Jerusalem at the time. And uh, as I said, Jerusalem, I used to study in Birzeit, which was 15 minutes north of Ramallah, and Jerusalem was 20 minutes south of Ramallah. And now it takes forever to get to Jerusalem, not only because of the traffic, but because of the checkpoints that block people's movement. So um, it's a completely different world from the Jerusalem of that period and the Jerusalem of today. And it certainly was very different from the period of time that you studied the most. So the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. And uh, and I said earlier, I mean, I, I was wondering if you can give us a sense of that period of time. Of course, uh, it's mainly through your work, your studies, but uh, uh, that was a, a complete different Jerusalem. Again, another sort of different world. So. I mean, you obviously worked on amazing figures from Wasif Juaria, uh, Isan Turjman, um, all of these individuals that uh, lived sort of, uh, you know, in, in different ways, their lives uh, in a city which was still under the Ottomans and experienced the transition to uh, to the British regimes and obviously saw demographic changes. Uh, is there anything that stands out that uh, you, you think it's always important to highlight when talking about that period of time? Well, my discovery of the people you described came much later when I finished my university training and came to teach at Birzeit uh, University in the 70s. So my work at the time was mainly sociological. I um, my interest was in uh, rural transformation, village life. And then all of a sudden I began to become interested in the earlier period of Ottoman transformations at the end of the Ottoman period after First World War. And my main entry to Jerusalem's spirit from that period was my examination of biography. Uh, I came across uh, family papers that belonged to Arif al-Arif, the historian, and then later to the work of Ihsan Turjman, who was a, a soldier uh, in the Ottoman army in the First World War. And the most important discovery was the uh, memoirs of a man, a musician, called Wasif Johari that you mentioned. I got his papers from his family in Jerusalem, from his granddaughter, whose name is Aya, and she's still around. She owns a restaurant in East Jerusalem. She gave me his papers, and I began working on it. I discovered a very rich life about the quotidian, the turning point of the First World War. Wasif was a meticulous observer of um, the musical scene, theatrical scene in the city. And he had his own musical band, which played in uh, for popular events, 
especially in weddings and uh, uh, family gatherings. But he himself was a, a chronicler of the city of Jerusalem beginning from the 1904 period. And he used his father's papers also to describe what was happening in the mid 19th century. That was a great discovery for me in um, using biography as a window to understand the social transformation of the city. So Wasif was one such figure. Another was completely different. Uh, the um, work of uh, Turjman, who was not a writer at all. He was a simple soldier who died at the tender age of 23. He was shot dead during the war by his own officer. Uh, in a very grisly um, uh, circumstances that I describe in the book. And probably the most prolific of the diarists of that period came later. His name was Khalil Sakakini. He was an educator and he wrote daily record of his life. And because of, he was a a cultural figure, a sophisticated writer, his vision of the city uh, was much more comprehensive and also much more problematic because he covered a huge period between 1906-1948. He, he wrote a daily diary, did not stop for one day. So his work, which I edited, uh, goes in eight volumes, about uh, 4,200 pages. And um, we published that in the Institute in eight volumes. And that work continues today to be one of the most interesting uh, venue of seeing the major transformation that took place in the city between the late Ottoman period the uh, the uh, the um, uh, war period between 1917 and 1920, and then later the beginning of the mandate. So somehow I deserted my sociological work and began to write the social history of the city through the eyes of diarists, memoirists, uh, not only men, but women like Sirin uh, Husseini uh, and uh, a very important Lebanese figure who lived in Jerusalem, uh, Ambar Aslam, who married Ahmed Samh al Khaldi, and wrote a lovely, lovely memoir of her life in the city in the 1920s. Well, the life, the lives of all of these individuals uh, obviously centered around the city of Jerusalem and uh, they all experienced the city in different ways. I, I was being fascinated by some of the entries of uh, Wasif Juaria where he talks about uh, the underworld. I mean, if we watch the news today related to Jerusalem, uh, obviously there are stories about drugs, uh, crime, prostitution, I mean, that's, I would say, obvious, despite the fact that many uh, people around the world only think about Jerusalem as a holy city. One thing that is clear reading Wasif Joria and others, even Isan Trujman talks about it, is, is that Jerusalem was a normal place, a normal city where also the underworld existed, where crime, drugs, uh, petty offenses, they, they all coexisted with this idea of a holy city of Jerusalem. Uh, you're a sociologist. Uh, how do we, you know, how do we see that? I mean, uh, how do we sort of uh, make Jerusalem a real city vis-a-vis -vis this idea of uh, of an urban environment that many only attach to uh, holy sites, holy places, religion, spirituality? Well, the, the sacred part of the city appears in the work as um, 
the site of ceremonials. The, the sacredness itself is, is seen through a series of popular events, which we call Mawasim, like uh, Nabi Musa or Khadr, St. George. Uh, Johari in particular was a bon vivant who described, because he was a musician also, he partook of these ceremonials as a musician, but also as a person from the city who held banners of the Johari family during the Satinur event, which is probably the most important popular religious event in the city. Satinur is the Saturday after the Good Friday and before the resurrection on Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, only the Orthodox Christians uh, believe in that event. It's the Saturday of light, when the light appears from the tomb of Christ. And it's a major event which Muslims, Jews, and of course Christians participated in. But the proces procession itself was an Orthodox event. Uh, so all these ceremonials is the way in which the sacredness is expressed. So the, it, it's a popular religion, if you want to call it. And it was not particularly recorded as a religious event as much as it was a popular event recalling the, um, the, the Christian um, um, e event of the resurrection of Easter, but uh, it was accompanied by music, uh, processions, and popular food that was given. Your reference to the criminal element actually is not so much evident in um, Johariye, because Johariye described the city as a continuous carnival, which comes as a big surprise to people who think of the city as a city of God. Um, Turjman, on the other hand, who lived during the war and died during the war, uh, ref refers much more to the underworld that you uh, identified earlier. He talks about prostitution in the city, uh, uh, not only um, uh, prostitution catering to the military, to the officers, but also uh, the sad scene of many women, uh, poor women in the city having to sell themselves because of the loss of income coming as a result of the mobilization of all the young men in the city, in the war front, in the southern front, in Gallipoli, in uh, the Dardanelle area, and in Ardrum, in uh, the Russian uh, area where Arif had uh, served. So the, this was a mu much bitter period in the description because the city had, was collapsing in a social fabric and a lot of people were resorting to petty theft and uh, uh, prostitution and petty criminal act. That you find in the war memoirs or diary of the soldier Ehsan Turjman. Uh, by contrast, the war period is described as a very jo jovial period for somebody like Johari. He himself was an officer and he called himself a oud officer because he used his oud, his musical talents, to entertain the soldiers in the barracks. And later, when he became a naval officer in the Dead Sea, he still called himself a oud officer. And he spent the whole, virtually the whole war period in uh, uh, entertaining soldiers and officers. Uh, to him, this was the height of um, uh, in Arabic, we have a term uh, which we say brush al al sukkar, to throw sugar on death, meaning that you make life out of 
the macabre period. It's a very bizarre kind of uh, period, but it's vividly described by Johari. And um, it, in a very strange way, he lamented the end of the war. Um, to everybody else, the war was a catastrophic event because it was the period of famine, of war casualties. The city was destroyed by bombardment, both the guns of the British and the French who occupied it, and also from aerial bombardment by both the German Air Force and later the uh, British Air Force. So it's a very interesting period that you can only read about through these memoirs. The official records do not record this temple that comes out very vividly in the writing of people like Arif Arif, Wasif Johari, Hassan Tushban, and others. I, I have a very personal questions related to these individuals, these people. In my own work, I edited uh, the, and translated the diary of a Spanish consul in Jerusalem during World War I. And at some point after reading the diary, talking to the family, collecting material, I nearly felt I actually knew, uh, in this case, uh, Bayou Bar, the, the, the Spanish consul, uh, you get so intimate with this material that you you start really having a conversation. I was wondering, wh what is your relationship with uh, Juaria and Sakhakini in particular? Uh, there is so much that they have wrote, and in, obviously you spend so much time working uh, on what they have written. Have you ever felt connected to them? And if so, how? Uh, indeed, I was actually living their world through their diary in such a way that I started dreaming about their life in Jerusalem. Uh, the most intimate part that you referred to was felt by myself in uh, Sakakini's diary when he lived, left Jerusalem 1907 and went to America and started a long correspondence with his uh, betrothed woman, Sultana. They were not officially engaged, but he was hoping that he would make some money in, uh, in America and go back and marry her. As it happened, he was living in America at the height of the earlier depression of 1907-1908. And the letters described the um, um, his yearning for the city in his dreams. One of the interesting parts of that diary is his, he used to record his daily dreams of flying to Jerusalem and uh, recalling vividly the sight of the cafes, of the schools, of the streets, of the aroma of food uh, through his dreams. Uh, one, uh, these dreams actually should be examined by a scholar like yourself to see how the city was recreated as a nightmare uh, because he was away from it and he was suffering because um, the period was coming to a war period. Later, when he went back in 1908, um, I wrote a piece about the love letters exchanged between Sultana and um, Khalil. I described it the beginning of, of romantic love. It's one of the few uh, written records of romantic exchanges between an intellectual and his beloved. Uh, the language is very crisp and uh, very modernistic because Sakakini freed himself 
from the stylistic embellishments of the classical uh, writing style of the period. And then he went back and what made me most moved by his experience is the event of being arrested in uh, November 1918 uh, because he was giving refuge to what the Ottoman authorities considered a spy. And that was the Jewish um, poet Alter Levine, the, who turned out to be an actual spy, although Sakharkini never knew that. So the way in which he was chained uh, with Alter Levine in November of 1918 and marched on foot to, to Jericho and then to Amman, from Amman he was put on a prisoner train to Damascus where he languished for several months in um, Damascus jail. And these are recorded very vividly that period until he was freed by Jamal Pasha the Younger and joined the Arab rebellion in Jabal al Druze. Uh, uh, he, he joined the Arabian army of uh, Prince uh, Faisal and it took him a long time after the end of the war to come back to occupied city, to occupied by the British. That period is vividly described and uh, it's very, very moving. One of the most, most moving um, recorded events of the war. Wow, sounds like, uh, I mean, w when you start thinking about what these people went through, uh, you know, you, you can really put everything in perspective, particularly as of, uh, you know, the contemporary situation with uh, COVID and uh, people complaining about their lives. And then you, you read what these people have experienced and everything changes. Like moving forward, I, I want to bring you back to something more contemporary. And I wanted to ask you, how does it look Jerusalem now from Ramallah? Well, Jerusalem now is blocked because we, the place that I used to describe as the runway of uh, Jerusalem airport is exactly the location where the checkpoints, actually checkpoint is an understatement because it's the barrier built by the Israelis where the new wall, separation wall between the West Bank and Jerusalem is located. And it's a huge barrier uh, which uh, blocks Jerusalem from the northern hinterland of the West Bank. Today, of course, in, uh, under COVID, we're completely banned from going to Jerusalem. But in uh, normal days, if we can use the word normal, it's the barrier where people uh, with permits and workers who have working uh, um, permits are filtered through that barrier to the city. I, I go much less to Jerusalem these days because Although I belong to an age which does not need a permit to go, I still have to go through the barrier and it takes a long period of waiting before we are permitted to, to cross. So Jerusalem in a way has become a forbidden city for me. And you have today a whole generation of people who are in their teens and their 20s who have not been to the city. They, they, their whole lifetime is they see the city on television, which is only half an hour away from us, and they know about it, but they rarely are allowed to go in there. So it's a forbidden city, which makes it in a way more desirable. And um, makes the events of the city more tragic because they happen in your absence. Uh, of course, the city is not completely blocked because 
the Jerusalemites come to live in Ramallah because it's cheaper. They work in Ramallah and people who have Jerusalem IDs can travel easily to the city. Easily is perhaps an understatement. So it's, it's I think the Forbidden City is a good term for it. And all the events we hear about, including the uh, Trump plan, the uh, movement of the American embassy, the building of a huge cordon sanitaire of Jewish settlements surrounding the Arab city to separate it from the northern part of the West Bank and the southern part of the West Bank toward Bethlehem have become a huge uh, separation zone for the Palestinians who live on this side of the West Bank. If there's one feeling that you would think of to describe Jerusalem, what would it be? Um, I would call it the unholy city because sacredness is attributed to the city, but it's uh, recent history, the contestation of place, including contestation of sacred space, have become uh, an area of highly mobilized vision of the city and lost its um, worldly aspect. The, the worldly aspect of the city which continues to be, of course, in the daily life of Jerusalemites, have been overshadowed by these uh, acts of separation, uh, settlement building, zoning, uh, demographic separation, and so on. So, and, and I'm exaggerating because part of the city continues to be a, a continuation of the cultural scene of the Arab Palestinian population, but it's an area of total separation, separation of the West Bank from Jerusalem and ethnic separation of the Arab side from the Jewish side. In the uh, 70s and 80s, of course, this was not the case. Jerusalem was administratively separated, but it was open for movement. Uh, our institute was located in Sheikh Jarrah. I used to go every day to, to my office in Jerusalem. And the city continued to have in my mind its, uh, 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 its uh, glitter in terms of what it had to offer in terms of concert halls, uh, bookshops, and uh, of course discovery of the Western Israeli side, which we separated from between 48 and 67. So the opening of that city meant that we began to discover uh, Israeli society, the enemy, uh, in, in terms of its uh, uh, aura, which we have been totally separated from after the war 48 and rediscovered again in 67. So that period of fluidity, which allowed Palestinians to encounter Israeli society, intensified a great deal, including um, not only mobility, but partaking of cultural events on the other side, access to the sea, my ability to go to Jaffa, which is the city of my my parents and the city I was born in, part of my family were still in, in, in Jaffa, and I would visit them on a monthly basis. Uh, that, of course, stopped being the case after uh, 1990, when after the Oslo Agreement, the barriers were set up and the uh, Israelis began to block movements uh, of people from the northern part uh, to the city and to the country as a whole. So the, this fluidity is very valuable for me, although it was um, it happened under 
the conditions of conquest, yet it was also a period of rediscovery of the city in both of its parts. That went on from 1968 until 1990. 1990, restrictions began to be set in the movement of people. And in the year 2000, exactly in the year 2000, uh, our offices was closed by the Israeli uh, uh, authority, and we had to relocate our institute from Jerusalem to Ramallah, which we continue with today. Before one last question about the future, I, I want to ask something, um, something related about related to food. You mentioned several times throughout the uh, the interview. Uh, the, 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 you know, this idea of Jerusalem uh, smell, um, the, the fragrances, uh, and obviously food, which is like one of the most important elements uh, in our society, which sometimes defines people, their culture, their identity. So I was wondering if you think about Jerusalem, is there any food that jumps immediately to your mind and you associate the city with that particular smell or food or color? Well, the, the food of Jerusalem is not different from the food of Ramallah. Uh, however, Jerusalem does have a certain reputation for stuffed um, vegetables. Uh, it's called in Arabic, Balad al-Mahashi, which means the city of stuffings. Jerusalemites are notorious for stuffing everything, including carrots, cucumbers, cabbages, uh, cauliflowers, but especially uh, courgette. What do you call courgette in English? Zucchini in Italian. So that is a particular specialty of the city of Jerusalem. In terms of sweets, there's one word that overrides all other consideration, which is Zalatino. Zalatino is a family which had a sweet shop in the old city near the Coptic area. And Zalatino sweet shop was specialized in a dish which is very famous called mutabak. It's a kind of um, millefeuille that's wrapped around semolina and uh, honey and uh, the Zalatimo shop opens at 5 a.m. for workers so by 10 a.m. the mutabak is finished he he doesn't serve it after 10 he starts serving at 5 and stops serving at 10 but the dish itself is extremely uh, associated with the city. And when Zalatimo shop closed off, closed shop last year, it was a major tragedy because although the family had major outlets all over the West Bank and now in Jordan, they do packaged sweets and you can eat knafe and other sweets in Zalatimo, the, the Mutabak has disappeared. It became part of our collective memory of the city. This is uh, extremely fascinating. And it, it, once again, there is this deep connection between people and food. Uh, you just made a comment saying that, uh, well, in Ramallah, the food is very similar to Jerusalem, but I'm, I'm sure some Jerusalemites would probably disagree with that. Uh, one last question. And I know this is like uh, uh, probably a big question, but if you have one thought about the future of Jerusalem, what that would be? If I have one thought about the future of Jerusalem? Yes, what that would be? Well, I would, uh, it's very grim at the moment, uh, but I think the, uh, the spirit of Jerusalem subjugated as it is today, is bound to be transformed. There is no way the 
acts of segregation and separation that took place through the establishment of the wall, zoning laws, checkpoints and restrictions, uh, cannot continue for a simple reason. The demographic preponderance of Jerusalemite Arabs and the inability of uh, Israel to continue controlling the city and separating it from the west of the Palestinian territory is at the core of the territorial question of the Arab-Israeli conflict. So now, uh, with the grim situation of the success of these measures, uh, is a fertile ground to another explosion, similar to the Intifada of 1987-88-89, and the second Intifada of 2000, which was much more violent, but these are markers of the inability of the Israelis to continue separating the city from the rest of its hinterland. And how this will be worked out, I don't know. It, uh, if, if 10 years ago the situation was much more hopeful, uh, Today we reached a nadir of encirclement that cannot continue like this. I think um, both the Israelis and the American support for the Israeli act of uh, encirclement know that uh, for the simple reason that you cannot maintain a captive population without neither granting them citizenship nor releasing this city to a future of continuity with the Palestinian hinterland. How will this be worked out? It's very difficult for me to see today, but I know it's going to happen. And uh, Perhaps the change of regime in the U.S. will be giving us a, a new hope of reversal. Um, I, I'm sorry to give you such a unpromising kind of, but it, it's bound to happen. And uh, as long as we keep the faith that peace will come, um, we, we have some ray of hope that it will happen. Thank you, Salim, for joining us here at Jerusalem Unplugged. It's been a pleasure and honor. I'm sure our listeners enjoyed your knowledge and also your openness to discuss your feelings about the city of Jerusalem. To all our listeners, please join us on our various platforms on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thank you, Salim. And to our listeners, I'll meet you next time. Thank you for having me. I look forward to your future blogs. Thank you.